Jean-Claude Boudreau and on the Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at Ryerson University. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Je vous remercie pour votre présence ce soir, pour votre engagement, et c'est un vrai plaisir de vous accueillir ici. I would like to welcome you all to the house. Nous avons un programme extraordinaire ce soir, avec des personnages animaux. Le monsieur Sheldon Levy, le président de l'université, Olivia Chow, député fédéral, et M. Charles Taylor, éminent philosophe et chercheur. Our program tonight is to celebrate the tremendous legacy of the late Honorable Jack Layton. Jack has a very special connection to Ryerson. As a teacher, he was a tenured professor in the Faculty of Arts from the mid-70s to the late 80s, even though he took up office in the city of Toronto in uh, 1982. He was also an inspiring mentor to several generations of students. People remember him as a friend, an untiring champion of many causes that aim to transform society. The poor, the environment, the right to fight safely, gay rights, youth engagement, and gender issues. Above all, Jack was giving voice to people who didn't have it. You'll hear some of those voices tonight. From the second we lost Jack, we knew we wanted to do something special to honor his legacy of Ryerson. We decided to establish the Jack Lincoln Chair, House and Faculty of Arts, that would embrace some of Jack's goals and ideas. We launched a quiet campaign, and we are thrilled that we already have attracted support from the following. RSU, RFA, QP, Public Service Alliance of Canada, United Steel Workers, Elementary Teachers of Ontario, Canadian Auto Workers, the Department of Politics and Public Administration, Course in Union, and more to come. I would also like to point out with pride that the first group to, to, to donate to the Jack Layton Chair were the students of Ryerson University. Thank you very much, and gros merci à tous. Thank you. You will find and you will have received some pledge cards when you came in this evening. Uh, we really appreciate your support and hope you'll consider um, giving to the Jack Layton Chair. Merci pour votre engagement, Ben With this, it is now my distinct pleasure to announce the inaugural Jack Layton Chair here tonight. Who will extend the spirit of this day into the future. Who will also help establish a framework and governance for selecting future chairs. And who will advance research that is near, that was near and dear to Jack's heart. It gives me great pleasure and honor this evening that the first Jack Layton Chair will be Dr. Meyer Sinatini. Oh. whose research explores intersections of immigration, urban, and labor studies in Toronto. Dr. Marta Sinatiki, founder of the Ryerson Union Fair in the 80s and 90s, very important to many members here this evening, also worked alongside Jack for many years and co-developed a course on city politics in 1978, which was broadcast from the CJRT FM radio station just down the street here in Victoria. In many ways, this course gave voice to Jack Layton in the public airwaves for the first time. It was the family's special wish to have Meyer become the inaugural Jack Layton Chair. As Jack said in, 19, uh, excuse me, in 2007, on the occasion of the department's 45th anniversary, teaching at Ryerson is among the happiest times in my life. I know that Jack Layton would be proud of the first Jack Layton Chair and so are we. Félicitations, Myra. Congratulations. <laughs> the, next, 
Professor Simitiki out to us. He's over here. We'll be hearing more about the Jack Layton Chair and the excellent work that Meyer and the team will be working on forthcoming. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce the President and Vice Chancellor, Sheldon Levy. A visionary, driving force in Ryerson's ascent, he has put Ryerson squarely on the evolving map of higher education and city building. President Levy has been an inspirational leader, which is not easy during a time of transition. A mathematician with one foot firmly on the ground, but is always inspiring us to reach higher. Monsieur Président. Thank you, Jean Paul, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. And I can't tell you how delighted I am, but not surprised to see a full house. And my, uh, my special congratulations to you. I know no one better to take the chair on day one. So, Meyer, congratulations again. I should mention that uh, a lot of work went into this, and I will thank uh, my colleagues in my office, but uh, Winnie, wherever you are, Meyer, we were all behind this, and I think everyone will say it worked. Because it also gives me great uh, privilege to say Welcome to Charles Taylor. Thanks for joining us today for this special event. Charles, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to also welcome Olivia Chow, Jack's wife. Brother David and his wife Carol. <laughs> Brother Rob. <laughs> and Doris, Jack's mom. As Jean Paul said, it is fitting and wonderful that this event is happening at Ryerson. So ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome. I'm happy you can be here and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Président. I now have the pleasure of calling to the podium Olivia Chow. Olivia Chow needs no introduction. She is one of a kind and a force to be reckoned with. An intrepid leader and passionate advocate for social justice. She leads with dedication and conviction. She also happens to be the MP uh, in my writing in Trinity Spadina. I've observed her up close and I can say she rocks. <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> a thinker, a humanitarian, a teacher. 
author of many major books, winner of the Templeton Prize, and the first Canadian to win the Kyoto Prize. All of this is well known. But maybe what is not well known is that Charles Taylor was Jack Layton's favorite professor. Yes, he was. He was Jack's professor at McGill University. And he had a profound impact on Jack's thinking, Jack's approach, and intellectual and political development. Jack loved ideas. He loved the dance of the dialectic. He loves grasping the intellectual underpinning of idealism, of the whole notion of social progress. Charles Taylor was an intellectual inspiration, but also Jack loved his professor's belief in action and engagement. Charles Taylor never lived in an ivory intellectual tower. He had the courage and conviction to run for the NDP way back in the 1960s <laughs> in the province of Quebec, <laughs> which had no NDP member of parliament, not then and not for decades. <laughs> Professor Taylor held the banner high and ran not just once, but four times. <laughs> Election. Social progress may take time, but don't let anyone tell you that it can't be done. So the dialectic, the engagement, the teachings, and the connecting of students, all these things Jack learned and admired in Professor Taylor. Now, of course, he loved books, the books. The last book Jack started reading last year was The Secular Age. He drew great comfort from that and from Professor Taylor's philosophy of living in the fullness of the moment, making every moment count. There could not be a better person for this inaugural Jack Lakey's lecture. Jack would have loved this and most of all, he would have loved the fact that another generation of students would have a chance to view the magic of his favorite professor right here at Ryerson, his favorite university. <laughs> it's perfect. So I'm going to say a quick applause. So it is with great pride and gratitude that I introduce the great and wonderful Alice Taylor. the party and 
We were, the beginning, really clobbered. And then, <laughs> as it went on, we did better and better. As a matter of fact, you know, in those days, you saved your deposit if you got half the number of votes of the winner. I think they've changed the rules now. And I saved my deposit only once. <laughs> my opponent was someone called, you mentioned him, Pierre Trudeau, which did, that, who did very well. Trudeau mania hadn't happened yet. But, all right, so that gives you the autobiographical background for understanding how I felt on the 2nd of May last year, that is last year, 2011, when there was this tremendous sweep. I mean, we, after we tried so many times and we got zero deputies elected in the 60s, very close to Robert Fisch, but still not none elected. To get C58 like that all of a sudden was just more than I could really deal with. As a matter of fact, it started with Tom Mulcair, our present leader, who won a by-election, and another experience, I am a constituent of Tom Mulcair. It's the first time I voted for somebody who actually made it to Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see how I reacted to the way in which Jack Layton really changed Canadian politics. And I want to talk a little bit about that in the course of my, my remarks, because what I, what I want to talk about is democracy, reimagining democracy, and let me tell you why I want to talk about reimagining. <clears throat> but let's, let me say this first. We have this very self-congratulatory view in the Western world that democracy is something we have, we've got it, and we're spreading it to the rest of the world, and we think that progress is marching forward and it gradually will extend everywhere in the world. Well, that might be, but it's a little bit too self-flattering and too self-indulgent because we haven't really finally got democracy. We still have to struggle with that. And as a matter of fact, you find in the history of Western democracy in the last couple of hundred years that we've had our gains and we've had our losses. And I want to give a, what may sound like a pessimistic view about that, but I think it's an optimistic view. Democracy requires that people understand how they're working together and believe in how they're working together. But that democracy, that's a rule of the people, is not something that's just obviously there. We have to work out, and we do differently in different societies, ways of bringing it about that the decisions that our government takes really in some way represent the rule of the people, which is what democracy means, the power of the people. And that's not something absolutely self-evident. It's very clear to us when uh, there is autocracy, when there's a single authority ruling. If you ask anybody in Russia, does Putin run Russia? Yeah, they'll say that's not very much in question. I, what's in question is, is, is it a good idea or not? But in the case of democracy, what you need is procedures, institutions. For instance, we elect a parliament of members from different constituencies, and then they, in turn, the majority, uh, set up a government. Well, we have to have belief in these procedures that they're actually working, and that's what rule by the people comes to mean for us. But you can see that as against rule by an autocrat, the question can always arise, does it really exist? Are we, in fact, in carrying through these procedures, these institutions? Are we really bringing about rule of the people? Or is there some slippage? Is there a way in which the decisions don't reflect what we really want when we go to vote? Or maybe we don't even go to vote in distribution numbers? No. So all these issues can arise. Now, I'd like to present an argument to you that this getting to the point where we really have that ultimate confidence, this does reflect, these decisions do reflect the will of the people, is something that we can never finally achieve, just sit back and rest on our laws. 
there is always something which is which can slip out of our hands. You just look at the history of the last couple of hundred years. Now, I'm footnote here. I'm talking about democracy in large societies. There are democracies in very small face-to-face -face communities, Swiss cantons in the ideal uh, case, where all this isn't true. It's pretty clear that everybody really gets together and they raise their swords to vote. It's pretty clear if this reflects the will of the people. But in a very large society, and that's what we've been engaged in in the modern world for the first time, we're trying to realize democracy in the kind of societies, in their size and population, that were only ever in human history ruled as empires before, as autocracies before, <clears throat> monarchies. And we're trying to realize it in, these, in this context. This is the context that I'm, I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, let's look at the last couple of hundred years. Our present democracies, we have our great starting moments, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. You can see it's been in some ways a long march. And in some ways it's been, uh, there's been some continuing progress. The, the prestige of class uh, authority, of hierarchy, and so it has gradually diminished in our Western democracies. There are in all sorts of ways greater equality between people. We have enlarged the franchise considerably over the years, uh, over, the, over the decades, over the centuries, in the 19th century among males, and then in the 20th century, a uh, real universal franchise. So it's been, in some ways, a steady, on um, one level, a steady progress. But on another level, it's been up and down, snakes and ladders. Why? Well, because Democracy is something in this very large context which is always in danger of sliding into elite rule, rule by certain elites. And democracy indeed starts as a movement to try to push back and get control from certain elites. But the dangers, the possibility of elitism continues to recur. Let's just look at the American history for example. All right, at the beginning you have the Jacksonian period, you get the rise of the, what we now call the Democrats, or then call the, uh, call the Democrats, and this is a reaction against a certain kind of elite. And you have here a population that's mainly farmers, mainly individual farmers. Right? And then later on in that century, there comes to be another threat to the democracy of the farmers, great powerful railroads which can charge them absolutely exorbitant prices to bring their, their wheat to market and so on, and again there's a fight back against that. And then you get the rise of a very big industrial society in the United States, and another kind of the famous rubber barons, another kind of elite power. And so we go on, and what does it mean that we go on? Well, that we discover new ways of organizing new ways of assembling together, new ways of bringing different populations together that can push back against this and realize certain of the goals of, of the people. So in a sense, the crucial thing about democracy is that it's always to be remade. It's always something we have to recreate. It's always something we have to reimagine, ways in which we can get together, farmers' movements, labor movements, and cooperatives, and others ways in which we can get together to push back. And if you look at the recent period, more recent period, you can see that a really very good phase, if you like, of modern democracy was the period after the war. In some societies it started in the 30s, but for many societies it started in 1945. When you had that kind of pushback, through labor parties, working class parties, farmer labor parties, other kinds of assemblages of different people together, and put in place, for instance, the great welfare state systems that we now have, in danger of losing to some degree, in, in the Western world. And, but the world in which these 
gains were made, in which the institutions were created, changes. And what's, what's happened? Well, we have now globalization, which has lessened the importance of legislation within individual states. We have the decline of the kind of large corporation which, after a war period, offered its workers real worker security, real security of their jobs, fringe benefits, pensions, and so on. Of course, that's the decline of that is linked to globalization, is linked to outsourcing, is linked to things being moved around, around the world. Then we had the tremendous growth in the importance and influence and possible destructive influence of the financial sector in the last, <coughs> the last uh, 20 years. So what we see is a new situation is, is, is created. A new situation is created in which the former ways of bringing people together, exercising power, getting their will, their desires, uh, carried out, which the former ways no longer really have the same purchase on the situation. And it needs to be, the, the whole thing needs to be, the whole thing of the thing needs to be reinvented, reimagined. I say reimagined because it requires this kind of common understanding that we are together in this, uh, uh, different people from different regions, from very often different cultures, from different kinds of organization, with different kind of immediate, very strong uh, demands and so on, that we have something very powerful in common, and we can work together. And that's something we have to work out and come to a common un understanding. And that's, that's what I call the social imaginary, our ability to imagine ourselves as linked in this way, as allies in this way, as working together in this way. Well, let's look at this now from a, another angle. And I think you have to say that the most important thing we have to imagine together in a society, democratic society, big scale democratic society, is conflict. Because you see, as you can see from the short, very short part of history that I've given to democracy, that there's always this theme running through it of potential elite control and pushing back against that and creating the mechanism of democratic rule. There's always a conflict over that. There's always conflict lines around that. We used to call it, uh, it was called by Marxist class struggle, but it doesn't have to be defined in the narrow Marxist sense of class. Democracies, big democracies, modern democracies, are always the site of either such a struggle of non-elites to get find their, their way, or else, or else they're in danger of degenerating in a certain way because they don't answer anymore the demands that people make on them, the hopes that people put them. They cease to feel, really, as democracies to large numbers of the population. So it's constant, this is a constant of democratic life. The ebb and flow of the creation of democratic control. And that's why I think you can see that the moments of greatest vibrancy, of greatest excitement, in a, of bringing about and putting through the ambitions of lots of people from very different walks of life and very different origins, managing together to get these into legislation into reality. These are the moments of maximum excitement. I could, could say that the most important issue, this is one of the themes I want to hammer on, in a sense the most important issue that can ignite a democracy is democracy itself, is the issue of realizing effective democracy. And these are the moments of greatest vibrancy. So you think of, very often disappointment may fall, but you think of a moment like Tahrir Square last year in Cairo, the tremendous hope that something new could come about there. The creation of that tissue of connection where people from very different 
backgrounds and situations could feel, yeah, we're together, we're together on this. And you can lose it afterwards, and it may be under strain now, and who knows how it will end up, that we all have our hopes. But think of the vibrancy of that moment. And I think you saw something of this kind, not as dramatic, over a longer time, in that post-war period, when people had a sense that they were building something new. We were building a really effective democracy. Or let me give you another example. <coughs> India today, India, very, very different democracy. You know, Indian political scientists is constantly astonishing because they give me some of their results asking people questions. Okay. If you asked in the Western society, somebody said, I'm going to make a questionnaire study of uh, who votes more, rich, educated, or poor and uneducated, people would say, what waste your time? I don't know the answer to this question. You don't even need to go out there with the questionnaire. It's obvious that it's the first, the rich and the educated who vote more. Well, in India, it's actually the reverse. When you ask people, does democracy really mean something to you, the positive answers are much higher among lower caste people, among women, <clears throat> among people in uh, the poorer parts of the, of the country. Now, why is this? Well, because for a while, so it goes on, India has managed, Indian democracy has managed to produce new alliances in which a lot of people who are in these disadvantaged situations come together and have actually made certain headway. It's these moments of making headway that really are the uh, very heart of democracy, that make democracy uh, really vibrant. Tahrir Square, the Indian case, other cases of this kind really give us the, the, the insight that the biggest issue of democracy is, if you like, democracy itself, making it real. And that the moments of greatest vibrancy are when we're on a path to make that real. And that, but that, but, that's never achieved once and for all. That's a pessimistic part of the story, right? That's the, that doesn't, that shouldn't cancel. Hope is better than fear. I'm tired of it. I shouldn't cancel the hope. That should kindle the hope, and that's what I want to talk about in a minute. But it is, it's an illusion to think that we, we can ever get the right institutions, get the right kind of party, get the right kind of organization, and now uh, it's all smooth sailing forever. History is showing us again and again that that's not, not the way it works. So let's look at our recent history. Let's look at what happened to us. I'm now talking mainly about North, North America, the Western democracies, Europe. North America and so on, of which we are very much a part. Let's look at what happened to us after that great post-war period where there was great headway on a number of issues like the welfare state and so on. And we find that we're beginning to lose what we were uh, getting, what we managed to achieve then, slipping away. I mean, one way of measuring is the famous GD coefficients, I mean, the, the gap between the very rich and the <coughs> average person, or the very rich and the very poor, both these gaps are growing. Now, that, those gaps actually receded, they actually declined. If you take the United States, for instance, the great Robert Barron period of the 1890s, and you take the 1950s and the 60s, they, these gaps declined. There was less inequality. People were getting, that weren't very, you know, not total equality, but they were much less great gap. And then, after the 70s, we find it creeping apart again. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing that today. That's one way of reading it. From another point of view, you could say that our understanding of what it is to be efficacious, what it is to have real influence as a citizen. I want to talk about this concept of citizen efficacy, the sense that a citizen has, yeah, I can do something about this, I can go and vote for that party, or I can join that organization, or I can do, uh, write to my MP, or whatever. 
something that we can do that can make a difference. Now, we've seen a shift in the same period, let's say, 70s to today, in the understanding of what citizen efficacy consists in. The major model of, let's say, the 30, the French have the expression, they taught no years, the 30 glorious years after the war. They were glorious because, from this point of view of this, because they were years of great prosperity, continuing growth and prosperity, which is not, which can't go on forever. But I mean, that's a period I'm talking about from another angle, the angle of democratic self-realization. All right, what, um, what was being, what the, the idea of what citizen efficacy was, basically in many countries in that period, was really you come, you, know, you can get something done through a party which reflects your whole outlook, a party of the left, let's say, which reflects the kind of program you want. So the major lever of citizen efficacy is you help elect the work in the constituency, vote for, help elect the party, and that is the way to do things. We see a kind of shift in people's understanding of citizen efficacy taking place in the last, let's say, 40 or 50 years, which uh, you can see reflected in the decline in voting rights, which are very, very high in most Western democracies. You know, 40, 40 years ago, and have, in general, the time, there, are, there are ups and downs here and there, but the general direction is the amount of decline of participation in the voting process. And at the same time, you see people getting another sense of citizen efficacy through particular causes. We'll join an organization to demand equal rights for women. We'll join an organization to demand ecological responsibility. We'll join an organization to the man that did not build a, a dam in this wilderness or whatever, right? These particular organizations get a lot of the energy that used to go into building a party directed in their, their direction. And what, what lies behind this? I want to just look at this for a minute because it's more complex than one thinks. I mean, part of what lies behind it undoubtedly is a beginning of doubt about the citizen efficacy through electing parties. Either because people feel the parties don't carry out what they were declaring they would, or because they feel the electoral situation is stacked against their party or whatever. They feel some loss of confidence in that direction. And therefore, people turn to particular causes that maybe matter to them. But I think there's something more going on here. There's some interesting cultural mutations going on here. I think that we have, people have found themselves more, a certain kind of individualism involved in the whole ethic of authenticity, the idea of looking for who I really am, or what kind of human life really reflects what, what my potentiality is. And some of this has led to a weakening of some of the previous existing solidarity, worker solidarity, human solidarity. Or the very <laughs> success, some degree, the success of those 30 years after the war, of lifting a lot of people into the middle class, I think, has helped to weaken those solidarities. So there is this kind of shift in culture, not all of which is by any means negative. I mean, when you think of the importance of these kind of single issue movements in bringing certain things on the agenda, like the feminist movement, right? bringing certain things on the agenda which were pushed and kept off the agenda for a long time. When you think of the tremendous importance for us of the, what you might call the ecological, ecological responsibility movement, the movement that we, we live in a planet that we have to take care of, including the spin-off, in this case, in many societies, in the case, of a Green Party. This is a new kind of moment in a sense. You see a party which itself is a party, but is focused mainly on a, a, a narrow range, a very important, but a narrow range of issues, as against the kind of model of the Social Democratic Party in various countries, which was 
kind of cover a whole range of issues. So we are seeing here a kind of shift in political culture as well as a negative sense of trust in the older form of citizen efficacy through I have a party, the party reflects me over the whole range of my goals and the book on this party. So it's partly a certain doubt about that, but partly another way of relating to the, the political world and a sense that, in a certain sense, I'm more in control of this movement that I really 100% agree with than I am with this big party that is many different issues and many different irons and fire and many different fish to fry. Right? So here you have a multiple shift in the situation in which we find ourselves in Western democracies that seem to the 70s and today. How many of them? The shift that I mentioned earlier a shift really of the whole situation we're in, globalization, the rise of the financial power, the relative decline of the kind of corporation that can offer lifelong employment, with pensions and so on, but therefore the fragilization of the labor market, the increase of a situation in which part-time work or temporary work bulks larger and larger, the consequent threat to a lot of people who felt they belonged to the middle class or from part of the middle class in a sense of now uh, in danger of losing that or their children or are not in a position to, to follow them. So you, and plus these, if you like, cultural shifts, the whole sense of authenticity, the sense that it's more, it makes more sense for me to concentrate on this issue and that issue. All of these together have helped to produce this imbalance, and that's what I want to talk about. An imbalance in which the power of the mass of people from different standpoints, different <coughs> cultures, different outlooks, but have much <coughs> less capacity of getting their ambitions, getting their aspirations through. And the result is partly intensified by the greater importance of money in, in elections. It's just clear that if you, if you're in the kind of ideal social democratic situation of the 1940s and 50s where you, the, the, the road to power is getting all your members out and working in the constituency and electing people and so on, that that is a much less expensive mode of operation than a world in which you have to get to them through television, and you may not have it. The worst case scenario is in the United States, where you don't have any kind of public television input into the, into the different campaigns. I mean, what I remember back again in the, in the 60s, the absolutely risible amounts that we raised that could run a very effective campaign. We didn't win, right? Good but <laughs> We didn't win, but you know, one of my campaigns was run by somebody who may know. And it was one of the best campaigns ever run in Canada. We had every single house candidate in the constituency four or five times. Unfortunately, the numbers were telling us <laughs> we're not going to win, and we didn't. But this is really, this is the kind of thing that in a slightly more you know, benign environment would have carried us uh, really to, I don't know how many seats in the borders of, of, of Quebec, and we did it. Nothing. And that's no longer the case. I think if you look across the border of the states where you see the power of money is just immense. The power of money. The power of money also in terms of the, its power over media. The fracturing of the public sphere very often into different media that speak to different kinds of people and they never manage to hear both sides, so that the whole debate is uh, very badly, very badly, the, as it were, hampered in the society. And again, that makes even greater weight have to be made on various campaigns through television and radio in order to get your message across. So in all these ways, we have a kind of regression of people power 
the more you need more money, the more money is going to talk. And the more money talks, the more people are going to lose confidence in voting as a vehicle of citizen efficacy, and they're going to turn off and not vote. But the more people turn off and don't vote, since they're usually the people who really need it most, who really are the least, uh, as it were, listened to, and that's why they feel it's not worth voting, they increase the weight of the elites and the money that the elites have in the entire result. There are a series of bad spirals going on in our society. That's what I really want to come to. There are a series of bad spirals of this kind which I fear are pushing us towards less and less citizen efficacy of any kind, more and more turning on, therefore less and less efficacy, more and more the power of money, therefore less and less efficacy, therefore more and more the power of money. You can see how these, these are self-feeding uh, movements. And so we see a classic case has happened before in which the kinds of mobilizations and organizations that really made democracy surge ahead, democracy as effective people power, surge ahead at time, one time, right? they're no longer really working, they're no longer <coughs> efficacious. They are they have to be reinvented. Right? Well, perhaps the most important thing of all, the most important bad spot of all, is and here I have a really, I have to recommend to you if you want to look into this, a really great French author on democracy, Pierre Rosson-Badin, who has a wonderful book, Sociopoly is a Go with Society. It's where he talks about the kind of equality which is central to democracy. There is equality of non-discrimination, and that's terribly important, but it's not the center of this is our quality of opportunity, and that's very important, but it's not the center of democracy. The center of democracy is not something that you get by comparing and seeing that people are getting more than others. The center of democracy is the common understanding between the imagination that we are citizens together, we're equal citizens together. Well, there are two components of this, two facets to this. The feeling that we're doing something together, which is what you have in a football team, what you have uh, in an army, and so on. But in the democratic case, the feeling that we who's doing something together are really on the same level, we are all equal in this. And that is a very, very powerful feeling. It can come out in actual experience in emergencies as a flood. Are down and everybody turns out and helps and we all know that we're just all of us, whether we're mayors or, or whatever, you know, we have some kind of honorific or what have you, we're all hands working together and moving the sandbags. That's the kind of moment when you can, this is palpable. Well, it's this understanding which very often is not entirely realized in our daily life, but which we can understand that we stand together and we're working together and we're on this footing of equal collaboration. It's that which is the very essence of uh, citizenship and of uh, the very heart of democracy. Now there's another very bad, vicious circle here. That the more, well, the virtuous circle would be, the more that's part of people's actual experience, like that moment with the sandbags when the blood is coming, the more it's strengthened. But the more it's just miles away from people's experience, the more it becomes unbelievable. So if you get societies where, let's take the extreme case, some very, very well-off people live in gated communities and other very poor people live in ghettos, how can they possibly imagine themselves to be part of Side by side. And here is where something very sinister can happen. That the spirit of democracy can survive this kind of thing, but by being perverted. Now look how this is happening. It's actually happening, you can see it. The 
across the border, unfortunately, here in the United States. And I, let me think of an example of poor Mitt Romney. I hope it's poor. But I uh, you know, <laughs> you know, made this, this remarks about the 47 percent. That is the idea that, well, I feel on equal footing with all the people that are really citizens, but after all, citizenship requires a certain ethic, and it's ethic, these people fail, fail the test of that ethic. They're just uh, freeloaders, they're just recipients of state aid, they are contributors. It's that kind of, it's that kind of creation of a division in the society in people's minds, which justifies people behaving in a way which is totally a negation of this sense of equal citizenship, but justifying to themselves because, morally speaking, it's only those people that are really behaving like citizens properly do who deserve this kind of solidarity. And the other very insidious thing is the, of course, that very often the sense of citizen being citizens together has been fueled by a sense of uh, our be of the same tradition, the same ethnic group, or what have you. And this has led to the possibility of people outside that, people from other cultures who come into the society, being excluded. You see, these two exclusionary moves are what are the ultimate poison for democracy because they make a barrier to our really finding a way getting them together. Now, that's the bad news, if you like, that these ideologies at the moment are quite powerful in some of our societies. What's the hope? Well, the hope is that, as I said earlier, the most vibrant moments in a democracy are when we are fighting to restore a democracy. And I see, if you look at the Occupy movement, uh, in anti Viados movement, all these movements, including the movement of the students in Quebec, Let's look at the Occupy movement as an example. What are they on about? Well, they're all about a poll, yeah? Or any poll, it's a bad thing. But I smell a lot. And that is something that Jack started us on. And that's why it's, for me, a tremendous inspiration to be here tonight and to talk about Jack and about the world he was trying to create. So what's the element of hope? Well, the element of hope is what I said earlier on. I think it's really true, that the moments in which democratic societies are the most vibrant, the most alive, are the moments when they're recreating people of color, when they're recreating democracy in new forms. So I'm thinking of Tahrir Square, I'm thinking of Indian democracy, but maybe I'm thinking of Canadian democracy in a couple of years' time. And if we can dream of that, we owe that to Jack. And that's why I'm pleased and honored to be here talking to you about this. Thank you very much.